And good afternoon and welcome to the Morris Federation series of talks and workshops during lockdown. And today we have uh, Matt Simons, who's going to talk to us about the Morris Revival in uh, about, starting in about the 1880s. So I'm going to hand straight over to Matt. Thanks, Pauline. And thanks, everyone, for coming along this afternoon. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, this might take a couple of moments. So thanks, Pauline, and to the Morris Federation for um, inviting me to speak this afternoon. Here, ah, brilliant. That's, hopefully you can see now the slide with me um, in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, thanks also to Jameson Wooders, who um, sort of prompted me to volunteer myself for this afternoon. Um, and also, I'd, I'd just like to start off by congratulating Pauline and the Morris Federation for hosting these events over the last few months. Um, I think they've done uh, the whole Morris community, as well as the Morris Federation, a great service in doing so. So thanks very much for that. And I'm delighted to be a part of it. So we'll begin. This cartoon was published in the satirical newspaper Punch on the 13th of November 1907. It accompanied an, art an article which praised the work of the Esperance Club for working girls in the cultivation of old simplicities. Uh, this comprised Morris dancing, folk songs and old games. The article described how, to quote, in many villages of England at this moment, teachers from the Esperance Club are at work instruction, instructing the children in the steps of those delightful measures to which our ancestors um, danced when England was merry. The catalyst for this car cartoon and the editorial which accompanied it was a public meeting which took place uh, the following day, the 14th of November, to discuss plans for a national organisation to support in the dissemination of Morris dances and folk songs. Founder of the Esperance Club, Mary Neal, uh, was so thrilled by this feature that she immediately took it to show her collaborator Cecil Sharp at his home in Hampstead. To her dismay, Neil found that Sharp did not at all share in her delight, quite the opposite in fact. She later described how, to quote, as he looked at it, I saw a kind of blind come down over his face. It was apparently the sort of quaintless caricature which offended Cecil Sharp the most, and he reeled at its sentimentality. It seems that the sight of this cartoon uh, did not comply with Sharp's objective at the time, which, as he saw it, was to restore, quote, a vigorous and native custom to its lapsed preeminence. From hereafter, the relationship between Mary Neal and Cecil Sharp, which had been up until then one of mutual encouragement and cooperation, turned cool and later became icy. Little more than two years since Neal and Sharp had begun what uh, morphed into the national re revival of Morris dance, they split. They later argued over the factors which consti uh, constituted the authentic performance, as they both understood it, which at one point seemed to come down to whether the dance was performed with a straight or a bent leg. So this afternoon, I wish to offer a fairly brief narrative overview of the Morris revival in England, which began in the 1880s emerging out of a combination of antiquarianism, folklore and pageantry. Coming to a head in this falling out between Neil and Sharp, the debate over authenticity remained a hotly contested matter, which was never finally resolved and might well be argued that the ripples continue to, uh, to our present day. Uh, now this was not billed as an academic presentation, but I do wish to make some comments on this contested nature of authenticity. And also, like the two-faced uh, Janus, uh, the revivalists uh, looked forward as well as backwards. So ideas of tradition and custom combined with those of aesthetic ideals. And Merry England became the site for debate over authenticity and tradition. In themselves, these are sort of nebulous terms which are ultimately impossible to pin down with any sort of absolute or final definition. Uh, and also, just to reiterate, this lecture is concerned exclusively with the type of Morris that we now 
know as Cotswold Morris or South Midlands Morris. Um, in, an, in the early folk revival of the late, late 19th and 20th centuries, this form was preeminent. So that's why I'm talking about it this afternoon. It's worth noting that other types of Morris, particularly the processional Morris of Cheshire and Lancashire, has a very different history to that of the Cotswold Morris and is so deserving of a, of a different presentation by somebody more qualified in that respect than I. And much of this lecture is uh, based on my doctoral researches, uh, which were undertaken at De Montfort University uh, between 2015 and 2019. I could well begin this lecture in the style of Jim Dixon, the eponymous anti-hero of Kingsley Amis's comic novel, Lucky Jim. Intoxicated by sherry and whiskey, the feckless Mr. Dixon causes great embarrassment to his uh, superior, the censorious Professor Welsh. An enthusiast for madrigals, the professor uh, tasked uh, young Jim Dixon with uh, giving a lecture on Merry England. Of course, the professor had written this lecture himself, um, and to his distress, the intoxicated Jim declaimed, the point about Merry England is that it was about the most unmerry period in our history. It's only the homemade pottery crowd, the organic husbandry crowd, the recorder playing crowd, the Esperanto, and from there he trails off before passing out in a drunken haze. Now, this is one approach to the myth of Merry England, though it's not a terribly useful one. It's easy enough to point out the illusory qualities of the mythical ideal, exposing it as a sham, but I think it's more interesting and more useful to gain an understanding of exactly how and why this myth of Merry England came about in the first instance. Nations as imagined communities cannot exist without their various myths. And um, this sort of all comes together in what's known as the invention of tradition. And this concept doesn't necessarily mean that traditions are invented and are so, so are completely new. Neither does it mean that all myths are outright fakes and lies, but that these traditions and these myths have certain truths which are deemed useful or desirable to a particular community at a particular time. And this is something I'd like you to bear in mind throughout the course of this lecture. The early Morris revival was based on this combining of popular literary myth and emergent anthropological study, which to quote Keith Chandler, in form and content represented the ultimate triumph of antiquity over actuality. And the basis to this idea of Merry England initially can be found in antiquarianism. And this really took off in the late 18th century and these are just a few select few publications which had things to say on Morris dancing alongside other customs such as maypoles, may garlands and the like. These writers were altogether more interested in discussing the supposedly ancient origins than they were in discussing historical development over time. Their objective was to discern the precedent for Georgian or Victorian England seeking to ratify its ancientness by chronicling customs and laying down lineages. Marketed primarily at the aspirational middle classes, these works inspired artists and designers and later became manuals for staging grand pageants and festivals all around the idea of Merry England. Among the advocates of these uh, festivals was uh, art critic and philanthropist John Ruskin and through various local institutions and voluntary organizations visions of merry England spread in a frenzy in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. At the same time antiquarianism and anthropology collided to form a new discipline which became known as folklore and this was coined by William Toms in 1846. In 1878, William Toms uh, was a founder member of the Folklore Society in London and became a leading influence in the fledgling society. Another big influence at this time was E.B. Tyler, whose work on primitive culture uh, set out a sort of 
pseudo-scientific framework for folklore, which was based on a theory of survivals in culture. Um, and the work of this embryonic folklore society also inspired James Fraser on the right of this slide, whose Golden Bough, a study in comparative religion, um, came to dominate the intellectual perspective on folklore. To summarize very briefly, Fraser posited that civilization moved from magic through monotheism towards rational scientific thought. And as such, old religions were perceived as fertility cults concerned with the worship and periodic sacrifice of a sacred king. So this was um, a very sort of brief whistle-stop tour, uh, the intellectual and literary context um, from which the Morris revival emerged. And so um, though originally a pursuit of the well-to-do, these theories um, percolated down through popular literature, coloring the late Victorian pageants, not only with a kind of academic legitimacy, but also a kind of, sort of mystical wonder at the sort of pre-Christian origins that were supposed. But it's of course assumed when we're talking of a revival as we are this afternoon, we accept there has to be the period of decline beforehand. And once a commonplace appearance in, in uh, summertime festivals in the English South Midlands, um, by 1900, Morris dancing had all but disappeared from the counties of the South Midlands of England. And this uh, graph is from Keith Chandler's uh, Morris Dancing in the South Midlands. Uh, and it shows here a peak and around in the 1850s, followed by quite a steady decline in the latter half of the, the century. It's also worth noting, of course, that the, the rise in the early part of the century um, more or less mirrors that of its decline. How can we account for this decline? Well, very briefly, by 1851, the majority of the English population are living in towns and cities, uh, though the heat of the Industrial Revolution was already beginning to cool slightly. Rural decline was uh, very much confirmed, and the so-called old culture, that of common law and custom, was all but extinct. For an increasingly large number of young people especially, rural roots were something to escape and not to glorify. At the same time, the tastes and fashions of the elite and the poor became increasingly polarized. And in many places, the gentry turned away from the old, older sports, taking with them their patronage. So by the latter half of the 19th century, Morris dancing was both unfashionable and undesirable. And it faded really into to almost total obscurity. And so the band of revivalists set about piecing together fragments of activity, which in many places had not been seen for many years. Broadly speaking, the methods of the Morris dance revivalists uh, followed those of the folk song collectors, um, and indeed the histories of the Morris and folk song revivals are overlapping with many protagonists in common. Now, in 1911, one publisher of Morris dances, uh, John Graham, commented that the worth of, of Morris dances was only appreciated fully when they were dying. And so perceived as this symptom of uh, terminal decline of village life, the revival mission was to rescue the fragments of this supposedly old culture. And the collectors wanted to locate and define the musical tradition of a nation, which had been recently described as one German critic as das Land ohne Musik, or the land without music. In the midst of this widespread fervor for merry England that was developing in the late 19th century, the revivalists believed these Morris dances contained, quote, sacred English truths, unquote, which had been crystallized through centuries of transmission. So who were these revivalists? Well, let's start with Darcy Ferris. Um, he was the son of a, uh, an official in the Indian Civil Service and embarked on a career as an organizer of festivals and fates and pageants in 1885. As you can see from these, uh, these portraits, he was a very sort of modest looking self-effacing individual. Described by the late Roy Judge, he was a full-blooded and thoroughgoing romantic. Uh, 
and he absorbed volume after volume of these antiquarian tomes. But by the autumn of 1885, he set out to seek out those living informants so that he could stage a recreation of what he perceived to be the archetypal village Morris. He soon alighted on Bidford on Avon, which is in southwest Warwickshire, about seven miles downstream from Stratford, where a Morris side was known to have existed until the 1850s or 60s. Resting heavily on Bidford's supposed links to Shakespeare, based on a series of prodigious drinking competitions in which the bard is said to have participated, Darcy Ferris styled his new team as Shakespearean Morris dancers. Information was gathered from miles around from places as far afield as Brackley, Northamptonshire, and Idbury in Gloucestershire, as well as nearby Ilmington. He appointed William Trotman, who had been a dancer in his youth at Idbury, to lead in the training, and he was assisted by William Richardson, who was a veteran of the old Bidford Morris team. The musician was a 17-year-old John Robbins, also a native of Bidford, um, and he came from a family of musicians. But convinced that the pipe and tabor, or tabor, was the authentic instrument for Morris, Darcy Ferris insisted that Robbins should learn this instrument, and so sent him off to Wilmington for four days instruction with the village taborer, James John Arthur. Sadly, though, it seems that the pipe that Darcy Ferris was able to obtain was uh, of insufficient quality. So John Robbins played his violin fiddle for most of the time. So this, these performances were imbued with visions of the Elizabethan golden age, um, but the dancers themselves were mostly young agricultural workers. Um, each member of the company was bound to a strict set of rules detailed in a contract. They were paid a fixed sum of one shilling sixpence a day, except Sundays, and were subject to, and I quote from the, from the rules, fines for insubordination, drunkenness, or misconduct, which varied from sixpence to two shillings sixpence. Perhaps a good idea for any uh, squire of a Morris team in uh, 2021. Um, but Darcy Ferris remained absolute control and his orders were to be obeyed. So in 1886, uh, Darcy Ferris' Bidford Morris dancers set out touring public halls and schoolrooms of the West Midlands of England, um, occasionally venturing further afield as well. In each case, Darcy Ferris was on hand, dressed as the Lord of Misrule, to provide a lecture to accompany the dancers. These were Podicrus's serious expositions. They, these were not sort of frivolous um, and fanciful displays, or so Darcy Ferris believed. And in, indeed, one press report of the final concert um, described that it was an entertainment which, quote, was not calculated to make the spectators ecstatic. I think we've all seen performances like that. Though the dancers enjoyed some acclamation among local audiences around Bidford and Stratford, outside their home territory, people just didn't really get it. Um, there, there was, you know, it was sort of faint curiosity, oh, isn't that nice? Um, and it didn't go any further than that. So Darcy Ferris ultimately was pretty disappointed that he had failed in translating his sort of, his belief in faithful accuracy into box office profits. Nevertheless, the Bidford Morris dances um, sort of did continue after Darcy Ferris left in 1886. And they continued um, sort of sporadically through until the Edwardian period. And it's difficult to disentangle um, Darcy Ferris's influence on the team because even though he was seeking uh, the testimony and, and advice of old dancers, he was undoubtedly still influenced by these works of antiquarianism. And so this is sort of revealed in the fact that he dressed as uh, a Lord of Misrule, and they also had a hobby horse, which is seen in this photo in the middle, in the style of the Betley window. So it's a combination of uh, sort of old 19th century uh, Morris with the sort of antiquarian Merry England type. 
the next character, Percy Manning, was in many respects an altogether different character from the ebullient showman of Ferris, who was born in 1870 into a fairly comfortably middle class family in Leeds and went up to New College Oxford. There, Manning cannot be said to have been the most diligent student, throwing himself into archaeology and folklore, field work and excavations took precedent over university examinations every time. And thank goodness for that. Because in the summer of 1894, Manning launched inquiries into local Morris teams, employing a, a local labourer by the name of Thomas Carter as a sort of aide and broker. In total, Carter collected information on dances from some 15 communities in Oxfordshire, recording details about their costume, their musical instruments, and the sort of events that they attended. Again, the late Roy Judge described Manning as more a collector than a scholar, concerned with the gathering of information and artifacts rather than the, its analysis. This may well be partly true, but with the assistance of Thomas Carter, in 1898, Manning also encouraged a local revival. Spurred on by the discovery of a photograph of a team of dancers from Headington Quarry, which was a small mining community about three miles east of Oxford, Manning sent Carter out to interview two members of the old Headington side, uh, which he duly did, and Carter noted down several tunes from these two members of the Trafford family, who had been members of the team when it last appeared in about 1888. Following these initial meetings, once again on Manning's instruction, Carter was able to convince the Traffords to revive the Headington Quad Quarry Morris team, and practices commenced in the autumn of 1898. In the March of the following year, Percy Manning gave a public lecture in the Corn Exchange in Oxford, and this was illustrated by performances of the newly revived Headington Quarry Morris. Manning explained to his audience that he had not interfered with the dancers' rehearsals, stating it was important to ensure, quote, there was no possibility of contaminating the pure tradition. That, that he said, is the great danger of today. Perhaps he was thinking of types such as Darcy Ferris and the Merry England crowd. But this concept proved an enormous success and received praise in the pages of the Oxford Press. And buoyed by this positive experience, the Headington Quarry Morris dancers continued throughout 1899 to make several public performances. And on Boxing Day of that year, the dancers toured their locality, dancing with snow and ice underfoot. Among their stops, was Sandfield Cottage, which was home to one Dora Birch, who had recently moved there from Somerset. Staying with Mrs Birch at the time for Christmas was her daughter Constance and son-in-law Cecil. Now, this Boxing Day encounter was not the sort of serendipitous um, encounter of legend, which we sort of come to accept. In fact, uh, Vic Gammon, who I think is on this call this afternoon, described this uh, sort of mythologizing of the Boxing Day encounter as part of the grand Cecil Sharp myth. No, in fact, Mrs. Dora Birch, uh, Cecil's um, mo uh, mother-in-law, had actually met William Kimber, who was a builder, earlier in the year, well, in 1899, and asked him to bring the dancers to her cottage each time they went out. Boxing Day of 1899 was the first occasion on which Kimber played his concertina for the dancers, and Cecil Sharp was so taken with the melodies that he asked Kimber to return to the cottage the following day to allow him to make a note of some of the tunes. With no work for three weeks due to the pretty poor weather, the money raised from his Christmas dancing and music making was very welcome indeed to the 27-year-old William Kimber. But at this time, the dances themselves were of little interest to Cecil Sharp. He was a music master at Luggrove Preparatory School and principal of the Hampstead Conservatoire. And he was really attempting at this time to establish himself as a composer. His compositions, unfortunately, were not all that successful. 
but he still was able to make himself a fairly renowned uh, figure in the English musical profession. And from the tunes that he collected from William Kimber in December 1899, he orchestrated some of them into two suites of Morris dances for small uh, string orchestras, which were published in 1900 and 1903. But despite this, the Morris lay more or less dormant in Sharp's mind for more than five years. However, in the autumn of 1905, Mary Neal wrote to Cecil Sharp to ask for advice in teaching folk songs to the members of her Esperance Club in North London. Something about Mary Neal, um, her childhood in Edgbaston, Birmingham, had not been a particularly happy one, as she tells in her own autobiography, uh, which is in the Vaughan Williams Library, by the way, and it's available online. Um, she later described how, to quote, the utter unreality of everyday life, unquote, constructed by her aspirational middle-class family resembled, to quote again, a pageant of snobbery, of delusion, of ignorance. And Neil devoted her life to campaigning for the transformation in the lives of women and children. One February morning in 1887, Clara Neil, as she was christened, arrived at the West London settlement an initiative born out of a politically charged Methodism. Upon doing so, she, she became Sister Mary, the name that she continued to use for the rest of her life. At the West London settlement, Neil there met Emmeline Pethick, who later married and became Emmeline Pethick Lawrence, and they became lifelong friends and allies. Uh, and in November 1895, they established the Esperance Club um, initially based in St Pancras. And Esperance, uh, from the French for hope, reflected the mission of the club, which was to pro provide a spiritual influence for the girls and young women of the working class in North London. Communal activity was a panacea for the sort of sordid materialism of the city, providing club members with opportunities to develop new interests and skills. Um, by 1905, they were based here in Cumberland Haymarket near Euston Station. Uh, this is from one of Charles Booth's poverty maps of London. Uh, that's Regent's Park, just to the uh, just to the west there. And they were opening their doors each night, putting on a varied program of activities for its members. They performed some folk songs from elsewhere, um, especially Ireland, led by their musical director Herbert McElwain. But until 1905, they, haven't, they hadn't performed any English folk songs. So when Neil approached Sharp about this in 1905, Sharp was the up and coming folk, folk song collector. He was keen to reform musical education in England with a distinctly na national flavor. And he was convinced that folk, the folk songs, folk music possessed this real potential to rejuvenate English music coming as he saw it from below and from within. William Kimber again. Um, the songs that he sent to the Esperance Club um, proved so, well, they proved an immediate hit. And Neil soon wrote back to him asking if he had any dances to go along with them. In return, he told her about his, um, his encounter with the Headington Quarry Morris dances in 1899 and Mary Neal duly wrote to William Kimber and eventually managed to persuade him and his uh, cousin uh, Richard Dobbin Kimber to go up to London and provide instruction to the Esperance Club, for which Neal paid uh, not only to cover for the loss of their day's pay, but also paid for their return train fare. So that they did, and the performance, the debut performance took place in early 1906 before an audience of about 200 friends, family and supporters. Among them was the leader of the Independent Labour Party, Keir Hardy, uh, and another early fan of Esperance Morris was E.V. Lucas, then a journalist for the Punch uh, uh, newspaper, who wrote, quote, the Morris dances alone would draw me by invisible threads to any hall where they were given, not only for their unusual alluringness and gaiety, but for their essential Merry Englandism. Um, 
So following the successes of this February performance, they put on another public concert in April 1906. Members of the club sang and danced, and these were interspersed with short speeches by Cecil Sharp explaining uh, the, the basic history and background to them. Within a year of this concert, members of the Esperance Club were teaching Morris dancing in at least eight counties in England, uh, including Devon, Monmouthshire and Norfolk, as well as other parts of, of London. And to this end, the club employed two women as full-time instructors, and these were supplemented by a further eight who were employed part-time in evening work. And this was the crux and beginning of the revival as a truly national movement. Clergymen and school teachers were especially keen to engage young people in wholesome activity. And in 1910, um, having recently arrived in, in the town, Conrad and Miriam Knoll wrote to Mary Neal to request the services of a teacher for the young people of Thaxted, a small town now in the flight path of Stansted Airport in Essex. Not only did this fit with the medievalism of Thaxted Church and uh, Conrad Knoll's Anglo-Catholic liturgy, but Morris dancing also provided something quite plainly for, for the young people of the town to do. Mary Neal appointed to the task one Blanche Paling, a young woman of scarcely 19 from a family of working class tailors in St Pancras. For a whole week in December 1910, young Paling led three classes a day in the packed out public hall in Thaxted. And here is the Thaxted team uh, with local fiddle player Alf Bishop in the middle on the occasion of King George V's coronation in June 1911. By this time, well, fairly early on actually, Neil and Sharp both recognised the need for a handbook to supplement the limited supply of Esperance teachers. The result was the, was the Morris book, the first part of which appeared in April 1907. Together with the Esperance uh, musical director, Herbert McElwain, uh, Neil and Sharp had seen the reformed Bidford Morris, going back um, to Darcy Ferris again, at a private performance in Redditch during the summer of 1906. And they added some of these Bidford dances to the Headington Quarry dances, which they were performing. And these duly made it into the first part of the Morris book. If you're looking closely, this is actually a cover to the second edition, but um, never mind. Um, and the notation for, for the dances was taken from the lead tutor of the Esperance Club, not from the informants themselves, but from this tutor whose name was Florence or Florrie Warren. And this included instructions on a total of 11 dances from the Bidford and Headington styles. Initially, it seems likely that Sharp's involvement in this in spite of his name being first, was limited to uh, notating the music and Herbert McElwain practically did everything else, which included providing historical notes, which were based on the reading of antiquarian texts. Some of those we uh, introduced earlier on. So here's the Bidford Morris at Redditch in 1906, which uh, Mary Neal and Cecil Sharp saw. And so to all intents and purposes, the Morris book was an Esperance manual, and the first volume included a dedication which read to our friends and pupils, the members of the Esperance Girls Club. But the conference of November 1907, to which I alluded at the start of this talk, was called to discuss plans to, to establish a society which would promote English folk music and dance uh, nationally. Demand had outstripped the capacities of the Esperance Club in London, and so they needed to, to form a, a larger society with, with greater sort of apparatus. Sharp, though, was by this stage rather skeptical. He was um, worried, as I said, about the image of Merry England, which had been published in, in the Punch newspaper. And referring to this, uh, this cartoon, he said to quote, we do not seek to revive the merry England of the past, 
we want to create a merry England of the present, unquote. And though uh, Sharp and Neil continued to work together until about 1910, the relationship between the two became increasingly acrimonious at around this time, um, around uh, November 1907. And Sharp played no part in the emerging national organization, which was called initially, a bit of a mouthful, Association for the Revival and Practice of Folk Music, later became the Esperance Morris Guild. And here are just a couple of pages from um, some samples of the Morris book in its later uh, editions. I'm sure many of you are, are very familiar with, with these anyway. This is a wonderful photo, so we'll we'll use this now. This is of this this is uh, Florrie Warren, who's the chief instructor for Esperance, dancing on a pontoon in the River Avon in Stratford. Uh, just cropped outside out of this photo is the um, the Shakespearean Memorial Theatre, and the musician here is Sam Bennett of Ilmington. I think it's a glorious photograph. Um, but the nature of the falling out between Cecil Sharp and Mary Neal is easier to describe than its original causes, but let's just briefly summarize the origins of their disagreement. Mary Neal emphasized the vital importance of learning wherever possible directly from the source. In a letter of 1909, she proudly boasted about how her Esperance instructors had been taught by peasant dancers in whose family the traditional um, dance had been handed down through generations. To Neil, it was this sort of Im imitative um, teaching that was the proper means of disseminating Morris. Uh, by contrast, Cecil Sharp argued that matters of style and technique were questions for the expert and that dances should be, quote, accurately taught by accredited instructors. Whereas in 1907, Neil said that she had no particular further interest in collecting uh, more dances and songs. Sharp was growing increasingly interested in, in collecting them, and he had already by this point gained entry into the Gloucestershire Morris dances, um, thanks to a happy encounter with William Stagg um, in Hampstead during the summer of 1906. And with the ass assistance of William Kimber in March 1909, Sharp launched a program of classes in, in Morris dance under the auspices of the physical training department of the Southwestern Polytechnic in Chelsea. Uh, in a publicity leaflet, Sharp explained, quote, no notation can tell the student how to hit the just mean between freedom and reserve, forcefulness and grace, abandonment and dignity, unquote. And in the same year, 1909, folk dance and song were, was introduced into the recommended elementary school curriculum. At this time, Sharp also set about making revisions to the Morris book, reflecting developments in his knowledge and his attitudes towards the performance. In 1910, he received a letter from Darcy Ferris again, um, who by this time had changed his name to de Ferraz, um, explaining his role in the modern Bidford side which caused Sharp to doubt the authenticity of the dances. And so in the revised edition of the Morris book, which appeared in 1911, Sharp had removed all of the Bidford dances and also removed any explicit mention of the Esperance Club, let, let alone a dedication. He did make some oblique references to their, quote, ten tendency to be over strenuous and adopting a hoydenish manner of execution. Politically, of course, this was a tumultuous period um, of an industrial unrest, as well as, of course, the campaigns for women's suffrage. Mary Neal and Emmeline Pethick Lawrence were both members of the uh, Women's Social and Political Union. Neal had even taken the minutes at the first meeting of the, uh, the first London meeting of the society. Um, and Pethick Lawrence founded this periodical, Votes for Women. Esperance dancers, perhaps unsurprisingly, also attended rallies in support of women's suffrage, and Pethick Lawrence included articles in the newspaper about, uh, about Morris dancing and the Esperance Club. 
Sharp, however, was hostile towards the suffragettes in particular and the WSPU. And he did not approve of mixing Morris dance, which he perceived as an art product, with political or philanthropic movements. And though he didn't have any sort of fundamental objection to women dancing Morris, at least explicitly, he explained that it was um, traditionally, uh, it, as he said in, in the revised Morris book, traditionally a man's dance. But he did say um, that, uh, to quote, though it is not strictly in accordance with ancient usage, no great violence will be done to, tr to tradition so long as the dance is performed by members of one sex only. He also wrote, at its best, a women's Morris must also always be of the nature of a free translation rather than an exact reproduction of the traditional dance. So even though Sharp was not saying that women shouldn't dance, he, he was clear in this sort of hierarchy between, between the two. At this time, Sharp was also changing his attitudes about the history of the dance. And this was shown in the rev revised parts of the Morris book, where he talks, quote, about seasonal pagan observances prevalent among primitive communities, unquote. Um, and this comes in part from another publication by E.K. Chambers, The Medieval Stage, which was largely influenced by James Fraser and those uh, sort of theories we discussed earlier on. Mary Neal, it must be pointed out, was not immune to these theories of sacrificial rites and priestly rituals, and also wrote um, in support of those ideas. So ideas of the mystic and Merry England were really taking hold fast. In December 1911, out of the Chelsea classes that Sharp was running, um, he formed the English Folk Dance Society. Um, and this he perceived as an artistic movement. Um, and it was clear really that the ethos and policy of Sharp Society was in direct opposition to that of Mary Neal's Esperance Guild. The uh, society which gave rise to a proliferation of regional branches uh, with classes and examinations, as well as vacation schools and competitions. Um, Sharp discarded with the bonnets and long dresses that were so ubiquitous in Esperance groups. Instead, women wore gym slips and men wore white flannels, as is seen here in this photograph, attire not altogether alien to a physical uh, training college. So with this, Sharp was attempting to jettison the Merry England image, presenting dance as suitable for modern needs and sensibilities. But writing of a, an Eftus performance, Mary Neal described it as beautiful, graceful and charming, but she said it was too much like high art to be considered a truly folk dance. Similarly, on first seeing the demonstration side here, this is Sharp's chosen Eftus uh, demonstration side of um, about 1913, um, the Reverend Cover Comrade Noel of Thaxted said, uh, quote, but though Douglas Kennedy was blithe and graceful, unkind critics might have said that it all smacked of Bloomsbury. So as for Neil and Sharp, though their approach had initially been complementary, by 1910, the rift uh, appeared insurmountable. And in the years that followed, they moved, drifted further apart. Both were motivated by this desire to assert a sense of Englishness through dance, but their differences revealed contrasting attitudes to how this should be done. Most simply, Sharp perceived the mission as one of defining technique and style akin to a national art form. Neil, on the other hand, wanted to tap into some latent expression of rhythm and harmony. Both, it must be said, were influenced to some extent by ideas of ethnic and racial nationalism with reference to eugenics, which was an idea um, in the ascendancy during this period, appealing to both progressive and conservative factions. In summary, it came down to differences in emphasis. For Sharp, it was about training. For Mary Neal, it was about birthright. Before we move on 
um, from this period, I'd also I'd like to briefly introduce an EFTAS teacher um, who I believe deserves to be much better known. The teacher is Daisy Caroline Daking, born in 1884 to a middling family in Ipswich. Though we don't really know how she came to be involved in folk dance in the first place, um, she was definitely a dancer by 1910, at which time she was working as a seamstress in Barnet, North London. By the autumn of 1911, she was enrolled in, enrolled in Sharp's classes in Chelsea, and by January 1912, she had her certificates, she was qualified, and was sent off to Oxford to help in laying the foundations for the city's branch of the newly formed Folk Dance Society. Soon after her arrival in Oxford, Daking began classes in Atterbury as well, establishing a contact there with Janet Blunt, who was a collector of local dances and traditions, and together they collected several local dances. By all accounts, Daking was a very capable and popular teacher. She was once described thus, London born, deadly efficient, three feet high, with classes so large she had to mount a chair to conduct them. An article published in the Oxfordshire su Supplement reveals how Daking attracted a loyal following in the city. To quote, professors and biologists vied for her instruction. Rowing blues sat on her doorstep inquiring whether their left foot back shuffle was really coming on or not. From 1914, she uh, worked as a Folk Dance Society teacher in Newcastle, and three years later in 1917, she was headhunted by the Society and the YMCA to lead dance classes uh, for troops, British troops uh, in France. Here are some photos from her time in France, um, dancing sword as well as Morris. And she arrived here in May 1917 and started off pretty unpromising, it must be said, because um, most soldiers considered the whole thing to be, quote, somewhat silly. Um, but Daking late, later then turned her attention to the men of the convalescent department, and she see, succeeded in encouraging them to take up Morris as well as sword and country dancing. Um, and she remained in France until 1920. On her return to England in 1920, Daking continued to work with the YMCA and served on the Folk Dance Society National Committee until 1926. During the 1920s and 30s, she continued to teach dance and also wrote three books on psychology. Daking's life came to an abrupt and tragic end in 1942 when she committed suicide. It seems likely that she suffered from long-term depression which may or may not have been um, a motivation for her interest in psychology. She is immortalised as the pixie in Elsie Oxenham's Abbey Girls series of novels, where she was described as a person always on hand to, to offer, quote, help and wise advice. Now, the devastations of the Great War were acute. Of his pre-war demonstration side, Cecil Sharp lost four members um, who are in this photograph. Sharp himself had uh, spent most of the war in uh, the USA with Maud Carpley's scouring the Appalachian region in search of, quote, English songs. Um, and he was really quite, well, he was almost sort of broken by the, the news of the loss of four of his dancers especially that of George Butterworth, who's second from left on this photograph, with whom Sharp had uh, worked in collecting some of the Morris dances from the Bista region. With encouragement from friends, however, Sharp did return to work and the Folk Dance Society resumed its programme of activities. In 1919, Sharp was appointed occasional inspector to the government's Board of Education with special responsibility for folk song and dance in schools. He also resumed collecting and uh, carried on with that activity until 1923, which was the year before his death. However, the Esperance Morris Guild, which had suspended activities in 1915, did not return, and Mary Neal retired from the folk dance movement to focus on social work. She did, however, remain in, in contact with some figures of the revival movement 
and in 1937 was honoured with a CBE for her services to folk dance and music. During the 1920s, many places that had started up before the Great War uh, along the Esperance model simply embraced Sharp's Folk Dance Society. This was a pragmatic response, but it did have implications for the style uh, and technique of the dancing, as well as the attitudes. Despite the di disappearance of the person and organisation which could be considered Sharp's main opposition, the Eftus uh, was not without its dissenting voices. And perhaps the most outspoken of these voices was that of Rolf Gardiner, this uh, self-professed enemy of middle-class respectability. He accused Sharp of emasculating Morris, reducing it to some curious relic for scholars and enthusiasts, extinguishing some vital spirit of tradition. Gardiner believed that he, quote, had more of the spirit in him than anyone, unquote, and openly attacked the basis of Sharp's authority. Together with friend and ally Arthur Heffer, in the summer of 1924, Rolf Gardner formed the Travelling Morris, which was a small band of young Morris men, mostly undergraduates at Cambridge, who embarked on a tour of many of the towns and villages uh, where Morris dancing had once been commonplace. To Gardiner and Heffer, it was a kind of pilgrimage to holy places in search of, quote, a taste of the real thing, unquote, an antidote to the classroom style of sharp society. Heffer was useful in many ways. He was able to translate Gardiner's rather lofty aspirations into something more practical. Um, he made judicious use of Crockford, Crockford's clerical dictionary, uh, getting to know the local clergy um, of the area, um, but he was also responsible to act as an arbiter between Gardiner and the hierarchy of the Folk Dance Society. Um, Gardiner by this time was becoming something of a persona non grata uh, with Sharp and his uh, society, so Heffer was uh, an important sort of go-between. It's worth noting also that Arthur Heffer was very much admired in the society, revered by Sharp himself as a dancer of exemplary ability. So the inaugural tour of the Travelling Morris took place in June 1924, and it promised all the fun and adventure of a week's holiday in the picturesque countryside. Taking to bicycles, the young men slept under canvas and danced in the streets, refreshing themselves with much quaffing of beer and cider. Over the course of six days, they performed in various places, including Burford, Stowe-on-the-Wold, as well as Adderbury, Leddington and Leafield. During the tour, they met 14 individuals who had knowledge of Morris dances, um, including several old dancers and musicians who Sharp had met before. As Arthur Peck later described, quote, this was the first contact of the new generation of Morris men with those traditional dancers still surviving. And here's a couple of photos from those encounters on the left with Joe Pole of Bucknell and on the right in Brackley. I think that's the marketplace. But thanks to the efforts of various members of the Travelling Morris, most notably Kenworthy Schofield, Arthur Peck, and later Lionel Bacon and Russell Wortley, the tours of the Travelling Morris unearthed new dances and tunes which Sharp and his contemporaries had not um, previously found. They also made revisions to existing practice, perhaps most notably in Bleddington, where galleys, which is what's in Cecil Sharp's Morris book, were replaced with the now familiar hook legs. These tours continued regularly throughout the interwar years and beyond, and continued to unearth new information well into the 1950s. Here's another two important um, informants. On the left, Charles Benfield of Bleddington, and on the right, Harry Taylor of Longborough. And um, though he was sort of enigmatic uh, and Attract, attracted a, a following of acolytes, Gardiner um, remained something of an outlier in the movement, and his influence on the Morris revival was eventually circumscribed by his uncompromising idealism. Um, he was a devotee of D.H. Lawrence and member of the Kibbo Kift Kindred, which was an enigmatic sort of uh, 
pacifist version of the Boy Scouts almost, but it was a mixed sex um, promoting camping and handicraft. And it was sort of surrounded on a, almost like a personality cult of uh, John Hargrave, its founder. Gardner was actually introduced by the, to the Kibbo Kift by none other than Mary Neal. And Neal sort of sympathised with Gardner in his argument with Sharp and actually wrote to Gardner saying, to quote, I must adhere to my resolution not to take part publicly in your fight with the Folk Dance Society simply because it is my fight over again, but I'm with you in spirit and shall do my best in private, unquote. But by the late 1920s, most of the Cambridge dancers had ceased to follow the lead that uh, Rolf Gardner wanted them to take, and even Arthur Heffer um, was, was reluctant. Especially, they were especially wary of Gardner's enthusiasm for fostering relationships with German groups, which in the 1930s became especially troubling as Nazism absorbed many of these organisations and individuals. Gardner himself was somewhat blind to the realities of Nazism in Germany and remained an, an appeaser up until 1939. Relocation to Dorset in 1927 uh, uh, did mean that his involvement in the National Morris movement was further limited, but I think his idealism and his appeasement were probably greater factors in, um, in the distancing. And this is his uh, Springhead estate, which is near Shaftesbury in Dorset. After Cecil Sharp's death in June 1924, Douglas Kennedy took his place as director of the society. He had been a member of Sharp's demonstration side and a very capable dancer indeed. He's seen here on the far left of the photo. And under Kennedy's guidance, the society turned its attention increasingly towards the issue of uh, opportunity or problem of increasing male participation in Morris dance. In 1923, uh, the Folk Dance Society had a membership of about 650. Five-sixths of these were women, and though losses in the Great War exacerbated an existing disparity between genders, even before 1914, women outnumbered men in the society at a rate of four to one. In 1925, members of the society discussed uh, practical measures of how to encourage more men to take up dancing. Methods range from personal introductions by friends and colleagues to the provision of classes in Morris for men only. At around this time, a num number of new men's clubs emerged, including those at Cambridge, Letchworth and Thaxted. And these Morris sides um, not only sought to promote the supposedly masculine attributes of the dance, but they also sought to pioneer a new approach to teaching and performance rooted in informal and sociable so homosocial groupings in a kind of imitation of the old 19th century village Morris. As Kenworthy Schofield, who became the second squire of the Morris Ring, described in 1934, quote, it is not denied that men can and do derive much enjoyment in taking part in headquarters or branch demonstrations at which they perform Morris dances. But there has grown a strong feeling among Morris men generally that the Morris, besides being done in this way, must also be given the chance of a more independent existence if it is a, once again to take root." Unquote. And so founded in 1924 out of the group which comprised the first traveling Morris, the Cambridge Morris men developed a new sort of group identity, adopting the titles of squire rather than president and bagman in place of secretary. In many cases, such as was the case in uh, Cambridge, uh, these new groups of Morris men were in reality little more than consolidation of existing sort of um, social and friendship networks that, which had established themselves in folk dance society classes. This was the case also in Letchworth Garden City, where in 1922, the Letchworth Morris men emerged from the ranks of the established Letchworth folk players. And this is a, the Letchworth team here in this photo in 1926. In a somewhat romantic tone, founder of the Letchworth side, Alec Hunter, 
described how the best Morrisides comprised of, quote, a communion of spirits who learned from masters of the craft. So these sort of early Morris, team, Morris men's teams uh, sought to imitate the old 19th century village ways, aspiring to present the dance as, quote, a living thing, not just something that had been taught. Women's Morris continued throughout the interwar years, though unlike the new men's uh, clubs, performances were largely confined to folk dance society festivals and competitions. Women continued also to hold prominent roles in the society with the likes of Maud Carpley's and sister Helen Kennedy, um, as well as Joan Sharp, uh, a daughter of Cecil. And other influential teachers went on to marry dancers. These included Marjorie Barnett with Arthur Heffer, Joan Morris with Kenworthy Schofield, and Margaret Perkins with Alec Hunter. And in about 1926, um, a series of gatherings started to take place to support these new men's Morris clubs and to encourage new ones to form. Uh, the first meeting took place in 1926 in Ardley, Hertfordshire, and it was organised by Alec Hunter and Kenworthy Schofield with the support of the local vicar, once again, Reverend Frederick Percy Harton. And Harton was himself a keen dancer and um, supporter of the Folk Dance Society and who was later perhaps unkindly nicknamed by one of his parishioners, Father Fokey. The name of that parishioner was John Betjeman. Though little is known of this 1926 meeting, it was evidently successful enough to um, promote another one uh, in June of 1927, this time hosted in Thaxted by Conrad and Miriam Knoll. Of course, they were welcome, uh, they were keen to welcome the Morris dancers on the condition though, that they first attended mass on the Sunday morning before they donned their bells and went out to dance. The Morris Weekend in Thaxted became an annual fixture advertised in the page of the Folk Dance Society publications as opportunities to, quote, enable men to meet together and learn more about the dance, unquote. And these similar meetings um, popped up all over the country, including um, Kelmscott at, near Oxford, and in Hazelmere, Surrey. In the summer of 1934, these weekend gatherings gave rise to the formation of an organisation which became known as the Morris Ring. It was originally envis em envisioned as an informal federation of men's clubs which aimed to provide greater solidarity and encourage public displays origins lay not only in the desire for greater autonomy of uh, Morris clubs, nor only in the promotion of men's Morris, but in a wish to incorporate dancers of all social backgrounds. The plans were drafted by Joseph Needham and Arthur Peck, both of the Cambridge Morris men, both fellows at Cambridge colleges. As a Christian and socialist, um, who despite his distinctly middle-class upbringing, um, Needham, who, who here is on the right, considered himself a, a member by adoption of the proletariat. And so he was especially keen on the idea of some sort of federation that could incorporate dancers of all social class and background. And it seems that the seed of the idea may have been planted by an encounter with Alf Cobb, seen here on the left, um, who was a tiler from the Gloucestershire village of Sapperton who Needham considered as dancer and musician to be, quote, an outstanding member of the proletariat. So Needham and Peck in devising plans for the Morris Ring didn't wish to supersede um, Eftus, by this time the English Folk Dance and Song Society, or impose any new standard upon men's Morris clubs. Instead, they believed that these clubs, these sides, should cultivate their own sense of local identity. Though its name suggests a link to Gardner's Springhead Ring, um, this was coincidental, and Rolf Gardner played no part in the plans uh, which led to the formation of the Morris Ring in 1934. It was constituted in June of that year at, at the Thaxted Morris Weekend 
with representatives of six clubs in attendance. The Morris Ring was led by a squire. Originally, it was proposed that the squire would be called the Squire of England, but this was um, later um, uh, dismissed, and he was assisted by a bagman. The first squire was Alec Hunter, um, who had been a dancer with Letchworth, but also the Thaxted sides. And he was a silk weaver, designer and artist from a family steeped in the arts and crafts tradition, following in the uh, ways of William Morris. And here is one of Alec's designs, um, a damask uh, featuring Morris dancers and a fool and, and uh, a pipe and tabba player there. In October 1934, uh, the Morris Ring was inaugurated at Cecil Sharp House, the headquarters of the uh, EFDSS, which was opened in June of 1930. Douglas Kennedy conferred his approval on behalf of the society to the newly formed Morris Ring. But not everybody in the society was so keen. In 1936, the society newsletter featured a new ballad from an anonymous contributor which criticized and ridiculed the men behind the Morris Ring. And it, it was to the, to the tune of the Bows of London City. I'm certainly not going to sing it, but it says here, what we want is Morris and what we want is a ring where ne neither our sweethearts nor mothers can come nor our wives can get a look in. And it goes in this, in this vein for several verses sort of parodying the, um, the, the sort of foundation ethos of the Morris Ring. And it seems likely that it was written by um, one of Cecil's daughters, uh, Joan Sharp, who was then librarian of the Folk Dance Society. Set apart from their female counterparts under the umbrella of the Morris Ring, these Morris men championed uh, informal public performances, um, which they considered preferable to um, the sort of mediated official society competitions and uh, festivals. And of course, a popular space for dancing was in streets or in pub yards. And pubs also offered space for these sort of Morris men to be gregarious and spontaneous, giving opportunities to engage with local people. Um, and also gatherings of the Morris Ring usually involved a sort of semi-formal feast, which conducted in private, maintained ritual forms of behaviour, which provided a sort of fraternal glue to their association. Thus, I, I sort of termed that the Morris Ring took working class forms of association, the pub, and sort of grafted them on um, to middle class uh, forms of association in, in the form of these sort of formal feasts and meals. And they sort of viewed to cultivate an ethos of matiness, which um, attempted to transcend class divide between dancers. And by 1939, there were 37 members of the Morris Ring, and they, they hosted regular gatherings throughout the country. Here is a photo of the 1937 um, meeting with Kenworthy Schofield playing his uh, pipe and tabba in the foreground. But after the Second World War, um, the Folk, da Folk Dance and Song Society was not simply occupied in the material rebuilding of their headquarters. Cecil Sharp House had received a direct hit from a bomb in 1940, but also in the rebuilding of their operations. Douglas Kennedy in particular was keen to rescue the reputation of folk dance from the old stereotypes, well established even then. As he summarized, a popular perception that was that, to quote, folk dancing is nuts, it's sissy, it's kid stuff is the gymnasium when it's too wet for lacrosse, is sandals and beards, is a hundred girls and a man, etc." Unquote. Turning its attention to popularizing country dance, uh, the Folk Dance and Song Society delegated responsibility, in effect, for Morris dancing to the Morris Ring and its constituent clubs. The result was the gradual disappearance, further disappearance of opportunities for female participation in Morris dancing though some EFTAS classes did remain throughout the 1940s, 50s, and in, even into the 60s. The Festival of Britain, 1951, was a concerted effort to attempt to draw a line in the sand marking an end to post-war austerity. 
or at least that's what the government hoped. According to David Edgerton, it also gave expression to a new kind of British nationalism born out of the war and in a turning away from empire. Therefore, mottos such as the festival begins at home, disseminated through Picture Post magazine, carried a double meaning. The event was centred on a grand exhibition of the cutting edge of design and technology on London's South Bank, shrouded in red, white and blue, and other national iconography, the old embracing the new in an attempt to encourage people to feel good about the future. Whilst the main exhibition on the South Bank was intended to represent a great shop window, places like Thaxted were offered up as a living stage. Um, as uh, journalist and broadcaster James Fife Robertson said, uh, the audience can walk among the players and the players will be village people going about their daily work or combining uh, in their normal recreations. For many of the Thaxted dancers um, being art artisanal labours, uh, this fitted the bill particularly well. And many communities exploited the opportunity of the festival to host their own small scale festivals and pageants. Um, in July 1951, for instance, the Cambridge Morris men made their first appearance ever actually in the streets of Cambridge, and they were joined by the Winster Morris from Derbyshire, a side with a long history who had just themselves reformed um, after a period of abeyance. In London, the newly formed Ravensbourne Morris um, hosted a gathering of Morris sides, the first open air meeting of its kind in the city. So the Festival of Britain really sort of gave rise to some new opportunities for going out and dancing. In Thaxted, Alec Hunter orchestrated a folk dance festival, which was akin to a pageant, really, um, in the shadow of the 15th century guild hall in, in the town centre, Morris and country dances mixed the spectacular with the social, adding the Castleton Garland processional dance and culminating in a particularly mystical rendering of the Abbot's Bromley horn dance. There we are. And by this time, Thaxted was well known for its Morris and country dancing, so it seemed an appropriate thing to do. It had been more than 40 years since Blanche Paling of the Esperance Club had arrived to teach dancing to the young people of the town. And the fame of that, the Thaxted Morris was also reflected in a 1950 brochure for British Railways aimed at promoting increases in passenger traffic along rural Essex lines. By 1951, it seemed that Thaxted was every bit as authentic a home for Morris dancers as was Stow, Stow on the Wold or Chipping Camden. The legacy of the festival continued for several years compounded by the events marking the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. Both of these events were the catalyst to forming new Morris teams, as well as new events. However, uh, the Folk Dance and Song Society, as well as the Morris Ring, were competing with an ever-growing range of leisure opportunities, and Morris dancers ultimately failed in attracting a genuine popular appeal, whether for good or otherwise though the number of dancers did continue to grow at a modest rate. It must be admitted that this time, the 1950s and 60s, was not a good time at all for Women's Morris, which had all but disappeared, at least publicly. And it wasn't until the late 60s and 70s that Women's Morris would enjoy its own revival. Uh, let's get back. Um, so we're coming to a conclusion now. You can breathe a sigh of relief. Um, in spite of the best efforts to escape from it, popular conceptions of Morris dancing continued to be influenced by visions of Merry England. Articles in Picture Post magazine to support events marking the Festival of Britain reveled in celebrating village life and the trade of craftspeople and artisans. The Thaxted Festival of 1951 synthesized Merry England with the presentation of an EFDSS concert, creating a most picturesque spectacle. Popular conceptions of Morris dancing and Merry England remained alongside the continued belief that it had derived pre-Christian ritual. So finally, by way of conclusion, let us return now to Lucky Jim, Jim Dixon. And throughout Kingsley Amos's novel, Dixon regularly finds himself on the wrong side of his senior fellow, who is the Professor Welch here on, on the left, 
Anne Welch is the aloof and self-indulgent professor with a perhaps unhealthy appetite for madrigals and a particular interest in Merry England. Now, Welch was actually based on Kingsley Amos's father-in-law, a real-life Morris dancer and musician. His name was Leonard Bardwell, and he was a sometimes dancer with East Surrey and the Oxford Morris teams. Writing to his friend, the poet Philip Larkin, in May 1949, Amos relished in describing a moment when, um, during some lunatic folk fandango in which the men swung a lot of staves about and ducked and jumped over them, old B takes one hell of a crack on the brain box. Amos quite clearly and obviously despised Bardwell, who he considered an insufferable crank and snob, even describing him as an ape man, striving to revive the barbarism of old cultures. Professor Welch therefore stands as this stereotype for the nostalgic idealist so despised by writers and critics such as Amos and Larkin. The caricature of fanatics about Merry England as some sort of pathologically obsessed with everything ancient remained. And though the folk post-war folk song movement of the 60s and 70s was able to create for itself a public image which was rather different to the Edwardian kind, Cotswold Morris dancing appeared to remain more or less stuck in a kind of mystical Merry England, part of the ever-present past which goes along with, to borrow uh, Patrick Wright's term, living in an old country. Whilst it might appear that familiar tropes of Englishness have depended on a singular, unproblematic and stable past held up as a complete representation of national culture, hotly contested debates over the very essence of authenticity constantly complicated this process, and it reminds us that concepts of identity and tradition are constantly subject to negotiation and revision, no, longer, no matter how apparently fixed and stable they may, may appear on the surface. So thanks very much. That's all I have to say. Thank you.